Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today, I'm here with John Cochran. I refer to John as Voice of Sanity, but to the world as a whole, he's known as Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, and he also blogs at Grumpy Economist. John, good morning. Good morning. How are you, Tyler? These are the questions I want to ask you. First, why aren't real interest rates equalized across countries? That's always bothered me. Hey, you started right and easy. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> like Brazil has very high real interest rates for decades, right? Arbitrage doesn't seem to work. Well, that's not an arbitrage. So an, an arbitrage is the opportunity to make a sure profit uh, with no risk. Uh, so you got to invest in Brazil and you got to take the risks of investing in Brazil, which include usually currency risk. So real interest rate is is the interest that you get ex when you expect um, uh, you, you ex after the expected appreciation or depreciation of the currency. Then there's the legal risk and that they might expropriate your stuff. So uh, there's a, it looks like there's a profitable opportunity to invest in Brazil. Put that way, now it starts to look like everything else in finance. Uh, there's a what looks like a profitable opportunity. There's risk. Uh, are people properly balancing the profitable opportunity and the risk? So why is Tesla stock so high? Why are value stocks so low? Uh, you know, why does it look there? There's opportunities that you and I as an economist can't quite suss out what the risks are keeping other people from investing in. Uh, but if you'd like to buy a Brazilian gold mine, I can arrange it for you, Tyler. Well, but look, we know currencies are very close to a random walk, correct? So it would seem the countries that have higher real rates of return, higher discount rates, they should have higher expected returns on their market. Brazil is small relative to the world as a whole. There's a lot of capital that could invest more in Brazil without being systemically much riskier. And you would think that simply pursuing higher expected returns, that ought to go away. And real interest rates across the world should equalize, but they don't seem to. Well, all sorts of uh, apparent opportunities should equalize. I urge you to start a hedge fund. Um, <laughs> you know, so there are, uh, let's talk about what's documented here. There's the uh, puzzle of uh, uh, uncovered interest parity. That it does seem, you do seem to be able to make more money investing in countries that have uh, high interest rates now. As you mentioned, a high interest rate should go along with an expected depreciation of the currency. And uh, that pattern doesn't seem to be very strong. Uh, on the other hand, when it goes wrong, it goes wrong big time and all at the same time. Uh, so that um, our friends who have started hedge funds that do this sort of stuff uh, make make money for a little while and then they lose it all. So there, there hasn't been a gold mine in people trying to exploit this thing. It's one more hedge fund strategy that you're welcome to invest in like all the other hedge fund strategies. I'd also say, you know, Chris, there is a, an interesting, there's a larger question. Uh, you know, why is China exporting capital, not importing capital um, cross border flows? And it's one of those things that uh, uh, sort of bedevils us um, free marketers. We, we look at something that ought to happen more of. Uh, for years, people said, why isn't there more cross border investment? Then there started being huge cross border investment, which is uh, that has to go on container ships. It, it, money doesn't just flow. Investment means you put stuff on container ships and, and send it around the world. And now all of a sudden, no, oh, there's too many trade flows and too much hot money and we can't have all this cross-border investment. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, there is more and more cross-border investment happening uh, now to the extent that uh, many of our colleagues call it a puzzle and a savings glut and uh, sudden stops and so forth. I, I don't think judging uh, the right price or the right market is what free market libertarians ought to be doing. <laughs> and that's why I'm a little uncomfortable with your question. But say, say you take the major forecasters <clears throat> who are not at all stupid, right? It seems their real interest rate forecasts have been very wrong now, actually literally for decades. So what theoretical mistake are they making in your opinion? Uh, so let's talk about there's, there's two. There's nominal interest rate forecasts. Oh, where people, for example, for the last entire 10 years, everyone said, well, we're going to exit quickly, and we didn't. And then there's, uh, I don't think there's forecasts at the real rate, but there's this long uh, trend since 1980 of real rates going down. Uh, and again, we're, we're playing the game that Hayek told us not to play, <laughs> of uh, try, to, try to say what the, you know, sitting around on a, a, a coffee table, say what forces are moving prices around. Uh, 
there's all sorts of speculation about it. Um, we, we can have fun. I can give you the five theories and why don't, I don't believe in any of them. Uh, there are fundamentals here. Uh, we have moved to a much lower growth economy. So everyone jumps to, uh, let me back up, everyone jumps to the savings gluts and the Federal Reserves and the this and the that. There's fundamentals that say uh, low interest rates make sense. The first one is uh, we are moving to a lower growth economy, uh, to stagnation. Y you and I are technical optimists. We think this is temporary and will reverse. But the fact is productivity growth has been slowing down uh, and we're now a low growth economy. Well, a low growth economy has lower real interest rates. That's just sort of the first principle of macroeconomics. Uh, a low growth economy has less opportunities for investment and therefore lower interest rates, lower returns on capital. Uh, but it's, so weird that's that that's the, it's weird that that's the first principle of macro and all these smart people get it wrong, right? What's their defect? Well, I don't, I don't <laughs> have a <enough laughs> hard time figuring out what I think is right, let alone why other people get things wrong. Uh, and, and looking at people's heads is another bad intellectual habit. Um, there's basic principles that say low interest makes sense. Low growth and, for the moment, the low inflation. I'm not quite sure why we have low inflation, but low and anchored inflation means there's much less inflation risk. And furthermore, especially for the dollar, um, people uh, bonds are very good. Uh, they're very safe investments because every time there's a recession, bonds go up. Um, so there's there's every reason to hold, hold bonds in particular uh, to, for those lower than stocks. On top of that, you can put on your your frictions and your demographics and so forth. But um, so I, I think it sort of makes sense. Uh, but I also I, I don't like armchair theorizing <laughs> about things like this. We're in armchairs. Yes. Uh, well, that's our job. So <laughs> why is there so much active funds management? So we all know for risk rebalancing, it makes sense for liquidity. It makes sense. But it seems there's much more trading than can be accounted for for those motives. Doesn't this mean markets are in some sense highly inefficient if everyone's paying all those fees? Uh, so you ask two questions here. One is active management and the other is trading. Um, and, and I'd like to distinguish them. Um, and this is it's kind of a puzzle in the Chicago free market. Let me ask your question even more pointedly. Um, if you believe in efficient markets and you believe in competition and, and things work out right, uh, we've been saying we've scientifically proven since the 1960s that high fee active managers uh, don't earn any more than the proverbial monkey throwing darts uh, and a well managed low index. So why do people keep paying? for high fee active management. And, uh, uh, you know, that Chicago free markets aren't, we're not supposed to say, oh, people are dumb for 40 years, 50 years now. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of it. It's, it's one of those things, it's slowly, active management is slowly falling away. Uh, the move towards uh, passive index, indexed investment is getting stronger and stronger. Um, there is also a, there's, there's a strong new literature, uh, which I'll point to. Um, my colleague here, Jonathan Burke, has written some good articles on it. Somebody has to be at this is the puzzle of efficient markets. Uh, if, if everybody index markets couldn't be efficient because no one's out there getting the information that uh, good that makes markets efficient. So markets have to be a little inefficient and somebody has to do the trading. And then your second question is about trading. Why is there this immense volume of trading? Uh, when was the last time you bought or sold a stock? You don't do it every 20 milliseconds, do you? <laughs> so I'll highlight this. Uh, if I get my list of the 10 great unsolved puzzles that I hope our grandchildren will have figured out. Why does getting the information into asset prices require that the stock be turned over 100 times? That's clearly what's going on. There's this vast amount of trading which is based on information or opinion or so forth. I hate to discount it at all just as human folly, um, but uh, that's, that's clearly what's going on, but we don't have a good model of it yet. You know, by the way, the only stock I ever sold was Brazil Fund. Uh, <laughs> now, as <laughs> you well know- You sold it, and you're telling me what a great <laughs> opportunity Brazil is. There are habit formation theories of equity returns, right? As you well know, the notion <laughs> that the return on equity is so much higher than the return on bonds, because if you suffered losses on equity, it would disrupt your habits in, in a way that's a form of risk aversion that doesn't exactly translate into the inverse of the discount rate. You know all that. Now, having observed almost a year of pandemic behavior, do you now find habit formation theories more or less convincing? Ah. Uh. 
So let me clarify the, the essence of the habit thing. This is a, a paper that John Campbell and I wrote in the 1990s. What we're trying to get at was not so much the level of the equity premium. Why do stocks seem to pay reliably more than bonds uh, so much for so long? Um, it, it doesn't do a great job of that. What it does a great job of is capturing what I think the essence of recessions uh, is, and that's a time when people get scared. It's variation in, in risk aversion. And when you think about what happens in a recession, what happened last March, what happened in 2008, uh, what happens in every recession is not so much that people um, want to consume less today and consume more tomorrow, savings. It's people get scared. They don't want to hold risky assets. They want to hold safe assets. Uh, they act as if their risk aversion has gotten higher. And that's what habits captures. As consumption goes down relative to what you're used to, uh, you people get uh, more risk averse or unwilling to take risks on stocks going forward. And so the stock market goes down much more than the economy goes down because recessions are kind of mild. And that's really puzzling. You know, even people keep saying, oh, this is the worst economy ever. No, uh, the economy, you know, we're back down to the level of 2017. <laughs> Um, so why do why do these temporary fluctuations make uh, asset prices go so crazy? I think there's something. So I'm, I'm still there's something deep in that. And when stocks went down in March, <clears throat> I think people were scared as heck. Uh, whether the mechanism is habits or whether the mechanism is something involving uh, leverage and, and risk bearing capacity in financial markets is less important. So I, that was the deep point of the paper, which I, of course, I'm going to keep saying I think uh, is is right. I'm prejudiced in favor of it. Um, pe people do, but pe I think it's a deep feature. I think there's something deep to it that when you are forced, even even a person, a middle income person in America is is vastly better off than the average person in India. Yet, if you take somebody who's earning two hundred thousand dollars a year and make them earn fifty thousand dollars a year, this feels like a disaster to them. Uh, as opposed to you take an average person in a village in India and they get to earn $50,000 a year, they, they feel wonderful. So the fact that people's feelings about um, their consumption level and their actions, which is what counts in economics, they're, they're, they're you know, wanting to avoid a disaster uh, um, depends on their experience of, uh, of their recent past. So I, I still like that idea. Here's a question from a reader to paraphrase. Finance was really exciting in the 70s and 80s. There was Cap-M, Black-Scholes, Prospect Theory, etc. But what big exciting things have happened since? Where should we be looking for the next great innovation in finance? Uh, I love this. There, there is, so you and I are now old enough to remember that every age thinks of the previous age as, as the great golden era. Uh, I have a story, Bob Lucas uh, told the story that in the uh, late 60s and 70s when he and his buddies were developing rational expectations and uh, getting all the stuff that got them Nobel Prizes in Chicago. They felt awful because all the hot attention was going to MIT and Harvard and uh, what people were doing there. And they felt like they were out in the wilderness. And, and they, were, they were, of course, looking back at this. This was in the 80s. They were looking back at that as a great golden age. And now the 80s, oh, it's so boring here now. Of course, now we look back at the 80s as a great golden age. There's always this golden age of the past. Um, uh, what's going on now in, in finance, I find uh, fascinating. And uh, as I look out, I'm, I'm the kid of a historian, so I have a always a broad aspect. And I, I think of what our children will understand that we don't understand yet and all the puzzles out there to be learned about. And, and it, it fills me both with excitement and, and dread that I don't have enough hours in the day uh, to work on it. I, I mentioned one, why is there so much trading? Here's a fundamental question we don't know about asset markets. Uh, what happened in, in the last 10 years um, has been, I think, really deep um, asset, the field of finance uh, turned from what I was doing, sort of macro finance versus the behavioralists who want to put uh, psychological imperfections at the heart of everything. They kind of faded and an immense amount of effort went into the plumbing of finance. They call it in, uh, um, institutional finance. Uh, which is up, the plumbing failed in, in 2008. And so we learned a tremendous amount about the plumbing and about liquidity and about all the ways in which uh, asset markets don't look like the simple models, as you mentioned. So, you know, you, what's wrong with interest rates in Brazil? Well, rather than look to habits of everybody or to psychological imperfections of everybody, what people are looking to now is, well, who's active in currency markets? 
and uh, you know how our banks are active and how do their balance sheets look. And the facts are just astounding. Uh, it does look like when people put it, when there's a lot of demand, prices go up. That shouldn't be that in, in fine financial markets, people putting in a bunch of orders shouldn't drive the prices up. Well, pri- there's these facts about trading and volume and prices and flows. So the institutional finance, that, that's the exciting thing that just happened. And now we have a great new data point in front of us. So, uh, you know, any scientific uh, field feels kind of... Uh, <clears throat> chaotic in the moment, but I still think it's an exciting place to be. Now, this is the hardcore podcast, so we're going to plunge right into the fiscal theory of the price level and inflation. So in your forthcoming manuscript, you summarized it as follows in one sentence, quote, the fiscal theory says that the price level adjusts so that the real value of nominal debt is equal to the present value of primary surpluses, unquote. Is that still true if, on average, G is greater than R, namely the growth rate of the economy is higher than real interest rates the government has to pay on its debt? Uh, yes. Easy question. <laughs> uh, I'm glad. So um, I, I wish I could say the manuscript's forthcoming. It, uh, it's turning into the key to all mythologies. Uh, but there is a, a draft up. Uh, this is a big book project I'm working on. I put the drafts up on uh, my website as it goes along. And I just wrote a G greater than R uh, section last week. I knew this was coming. <laughs> um, that uh, So let me just back up. The, the fiscal theory, for those of you who haven't heard of it, uh, this is a attempt at the basic plumbing of where inflation comes from. It's not about uh, the Fed printing up too much money. It's not about the magic of controlling interest rates. But fundamentally, money gains its value <clears throat> because the government uh, soaks it up. The government can soak it up uh, by charging taxes at the end of the day. That seems perfectly obvious, but it actually uh, changes a lot about uh, how all of the monetary theory we do works. Okay, so it's related. It's among other things, I'm just backing up here for a second for, for our listeners. Uh, it says that the distinction between money and government bonds isn't that important. What matters is overall government debt and the government's w- uh, ability to pay that debt back. And inflation comes when people lose faith in the government's ability to pay back its debt. They try to get rid of the debt because they know it's not going to get paid back. What do you do with it? You buy stuff and that drives up the price of, go- of goods and services. So that's your uh, quick background. What is the fiscal theory of the price level? Now, our, our, our less than G stuff... Um, this is a, it's a broader issue than fiscal theory. It's the question of debt sustainability, <clears throat> and it's a big deal right now. Does our government have to pay back debt, or can it borrow? Here's the strategy. Borrow money and uh, never pay it back. In other words, just roll over the debt, let it grow at the interest rate. Well, for you and me, that doesn't work uh, because the repo man comes calling. <clears throat> but for the government, if the economy grows faster than this rate of interest, then the ratio of debt to GDP will come back all on its own without uh, us, without the government having to do a lot to pay back that debt. So this is the shining promise, which is really, so if that's true, and if it scales, this is the crucial thing, if you can borrow more and the interest rates don't go up, <clears throat> then uh, government debt is a money machine. Nobody needs to work anymore. No one needs to pay taxes anymore. You can tell that's not the, the case. The question is, why is that not the case? And when you look at the strategy, uh, that's just not about. So I'm going to root that back to the answer in your question. In today's fiscal, today's fiscal question has really nothing to do with the R greater or less than G, even though it's been a, a technical issue that makes economists just love writing papers about it because you get to do all sorts of limits and transversality conditions and, and interesting models about it. And, and the reason is, What's in prospect for the U.S. is not borrowing once and then running no surplus or deficit for 40 years while we slowly grow out of the debt. What's in prospect for the U.S. is borrowing forever and ever. So if if the interest rate is 1% less than the growth rate, that gives you 1% of GDP sort of for free. But the U.S. is borrowing 5% of GDP forever. Uh, and that just uh, that that doesn't compute, even if R is less than G. So if R is less than G, finally, to answer your question, big fiscal borrowing must be repaid by taxes. Uh, anything over one percent of GDP has to be repaid by taxes. And if it isn't going to be repaid by taxes, 
people are still going to try to get rid of that government debt and they'll cause inflation. Now, during the pandemic, government debt is way up. Production is not up. What's the prediction of the fiscal theory about price inflation? Uh, so um, economists should never make predictions. Uh, but theories make predictions. Uh, theories don't make unconditional. Theories make conditional predictions. Theories make uh, if X happens and you hold everything else constant, then Y ought to happen. Uh, but economics is, is awfully bad at making unconditional predictions. Um, you know, here's what's going to happen, period. And uh, I, I think it's a mistake to get into that game. But let me tell you what, <laughs> what fiscal theory says is, uh, in, in part, uh, you know, I've been worried about inflation for 10 years. And critics say, look, it still hasn't happened. So, da, 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 what a dummy you were. Um, government debt. F fiscal theory is not particularly special here. It just opens the possibility that if you have too much debt and you can't pay it back and bond markets get tired of you, that there will be a sharp inflation to get rid of that debt rather than a default. That's all the fiscal theory um, offers, which is in some sense pretty obvious. Well, that could happen. So um, uh, having built up a lot of debt, are we in danger of some sort of run global financial, uh, sovereign financial crisis? And I think the answer is yes. And you know, that's Ken Rogoff is out there. He, he's even uh, more of a hawk than I am on these issues uh, uh, most of the time. Uh, so we're, we're now it's a danger. It's like, uh, you know, Greek debt was great. 2005, 2006, low interest rates. Why hasn't Greek debt exploded? I don't know. Well, until all of a sudden it didn't. The mechanism is like a run. It's like an earthquake. We're in danger of a rollover crisis that uh, uh, bond markets look at uh, 25 trillion of U.S. debt. And then in the next crisis, we want to borrow another 10 trillion. And they say, sorry, guys, we're done. And now everything that looks sustainable is all of a sudden not sustainable. And the R's that were less than G are suddenly a lot bigger than G. So you're sitting on a powder keg and that a powder keg, a run, a crisis. If you could predict it happening, it would already have happened. <laughs> it's uh, it's one of those unstable situations. So I, I, the fiscal but theory. But interest rate futures are inefficient in this explanation, right? Not inefficient, no. Because, because no long on volatility of interest rates. <laughs> it's inherently unpredictable. I mean, efficient or inefficient, we're now we're down to arguing about information versus risk premiums, which I don't want to argue about. And there is even an inefficient market. There's such a thing as a bank run. There's there's the there's everything looks fine until all of a sudden the bank run, the black swan, the and and that's the mechanism uh, of of the inflation. So it can look fine. Interest rates never forecast inflation. We, we can get religious about efficient markets or not. In the 1970s, interest rates were not high ahead of inflation. In the 1980s, interest rates were not low ahead of disinflation. Um, as you, interest rates are kind of random walking, just like exchange rates. Uh, these, these, uh, this is kind of like a deep fact of empirical finance. Asset prices don't seem to move on information about fundamentals, if you want to call them that, like about cash flows, they move on discount rate news. Uh, there's another way of saying there's money to be made by buying, uh, buying when prices are low and selling when prices are high if you can wait a long time. So, so the, the, we're sitting on a powder keg. We're sitting on the possibility of a run, a crisis, which would be a sharp, unforecast inflation, which the Fed can't do. So yes, it's about risk. It's, an, it's not about forecast. That's a good way of, of putting it. Now, originally, I thought the value of crypto assets would fall to zero due to an arbitrage condition. I now think I'm wrong. What's your theory of the value of crypto? I think you're still right. <laughs> <laughs> so that market's also inefficient. No, it's not inefficient. Uh, it, it, we, uh, we need a, a way to short Bitcoin, in your view. That's probably hard yes. to do right now. But if we had one. Well, uh, you short Bitcoin. or Here's why I think Bitcoin eventually will, uh, will die. Um, because it is a pure fiat unbacked uh, money. It doesn't have a government that can raise taxes to soak up the extra money if needed. Uh, it's not a promise of anything real. It's just a thing that's in limited supply because in order to short it, you have to use up a lot of computer power. Um, but you can create substitutes. Uh, so it, it's classic. I'm very interested to watch the crypto community relearn uh, centuries of monetary economics. It's classic MV equals PY fiat money. It has value because it has a liquidity use. 
Uh, it's useful for anonymous transactions, to put it politely. <clears throat> uh, and it's in limited supply because it, it takes money to make it. But there's nothing that stops you from making substitutes. Um, there's n and nothing that stops you from making derivative claims on Bitcoin that uh, trade just like Bitcoin. Uh, so we, if there's nothing uh, that stops you from making substitutes uh, or, or derivative claims, eventually that value has to go to zero. And that can take a long time. Uh, so this is a, um, I've written about this too. Prices can take, so a market can be very slightly inefficient in rate of return and very highly inefficient in terms of prices. Shorting Bitcoin wouldn't work because it can go up for a long time before it goes back down again. So if it costs you even a tenth of a percent per year to short the Bitcoin, and if you don't have the money to stand the mark-to-market -market losses on the way, that price can be out of line, very far out of line. So 1% inefficiency in rate of return can be a, a factor of two or three inefficiency in terms of prices. And I think we see that all over the place. Well, let me tell you why I'm not, maybe not yet converted to the fiscal theory and see if you can change my mind. And it's the same issue with crypto assets as with dollars and T-bills. So they're pretty close substitutes, but they're not perfect substitutes. So if they're perfect substitutes, we're in the world of finance. All the curves are perfectly horizontal. Arbitrage determines everything, and there's one blade of the scissors. But if they're even somewhat imperfect substitutes, and I think they are, Ether and Bitcoin, dollars and T-bills, then you're in the Donald Patinkin world with a downward sloping demand curve based on something like, it could be liquidity, could be risk, could be whatever. There's a downward sloping demand curve, upward sloping supply curve. It's the world of Milton Friedman, Irving Fisher, something like the old fashioned quantity theory. And the fiscal theory is a special case of that when only one blade of the scissors cuts. But in a lot of settings, I think both blades of the scissors matter. Now, what am I getting wrong there? <laughs> so the fiscal theory does, uh, does not require that money and treasuries are perfect substitutes. Uh, it allows that, which is the lovely fact, given the greater and greater substitutability of all financial assets. But you can add uh, liquidity demands for all sorts of stuff very easily in the fiscal theory. So uh, <clears throat> it, liquid treasuries trade it. Uh, there's an on the run, off the spread that liquid treasuries have slightly different interest rates than unliquid un treasuries. Money can trade at a different interest rate than treasuries. Uh, no problem whatsoever to have a variety of assets that uh, have a variety of liquid discounts in the in the fiscal theory. The question is, do these liquidity spreads, um, do they determine the price level? Uh, if you hold the, you know, the dog and the tail don't have to be in exactly the same place. The question is, if you hold the tail, does the dog wag? Uh, and the central problem with the view you mentioned, the, the classic monetary problem, there are these spreads, but the government does not control the quantity of money doesn't even pretend to control the quantity of money anymore. Uh, so um, you, you need a liquidity demand for some special asset money, and you need the government to control its supply if you want that to determine the price level. Instead, the price level is determined by fiscal theory, and then the quantities of money versus other assets are determined by people's uh, desire for, uh, for various liquidity, um, liquidity things. So all the liquidity ends up doing is it ends up driving slight interest rate spreads. If the government doesn't give you enough money, then you have a little bit higher interest rate spread on one asset versus another. But that's not the key for determining the price level when the government doesn't control the supply of money. Healthcare. I'm a big fan of your proposal for what I think you called time consistent health insurance. So you buy health insurance and you buy insurance against your premia going up. So if later on you develop a serious condition, you're insured against the fact that your insurance costs more, right? Now, why Absolutely. has no one done this? Because it does make sense. Uh, people did it <laughs> until it was made illegal. And who did it? When? Where? <laughs> oh, God. It was in the 1990s. Uh, which insurance company? This is deep in... Uh, so a good, uh, a, a better word for it that Mike Cannon at Cato came up with is health status insurance, uh, that you can insure yourself against the risk of getting sick in the future. And uh, one insurance company started offering the right to buy health insurance in the future if you're sick now, uh, which is essentially that's the beginning of the idea. Also, in the good old fashioned health insurance, uh, starting in the 1990s, was guaranteed renewable. 
meaning if you bought the health insurance now, you had the right to continue buying that health insurance without your premiums going up if you got sick. That's essentially the same thing as health status insurance. So uh, private insurance was working its way in this direction. And but why so, did it take so long? It wasn't dominant back then, right? This well, is another you know, example of market inefficiency? Um, come on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> technical innovation takes a remarkably long time to spread. Uh, and this is a technical innovation. So one thing is just, it takes time for institutional, especially in an incredibly regulated industry where you have 50 state regulators who have to bless every single contract. Uh, it takes a long time. And then it was made illegal uh, under Obamacare, which why isn't happening. You know, it's, it's taking, uh, United Airlines still hasn't figured out that Southwest knows how to get people on planes faster. <laughs> that sort of stuff takes time. But also, um, the reason this, why wasn't this in health insurance to start with? Uh, when health insurance first started up, um, there wasn't this thing of a disease, of a pre-existing condition, of a, uh, a something that we get news that's going to make you really expensive. You either kind of die or you didn't die, and that was the end of that. Um, so uh, very expensive health that is very persistent and where you need insurance against ongoing future expenses that can't be done in a one-year contract. That's also uh, you know something that we didn't have until the 1960s or 70s. Institutions take a while to adapt. Um, you got to take a longer run view here, Tyler. But I do want to ad advertise it for, for our listeners who haven't heard about it. We're still in this, uh, you know, pre-existing conditions as the original sin of markets, whereby the government must completely screw up your and my healthcare. That is not true. Uh, free markets can handle the question of pre-existing conditions, your need for long-term insurance. Term life insurance has had it forever. If you buy term life insurance uh, when you're young and healthy, you get to keep that insurance no matter how sick you get uh, as time goes on. So there's, there's no failure of insurance markets that means we can't have. How much do you worry about superior genetic information making it hard for insurance to actually serve insurance purposes? So it would be fairly priced. You could buy it, but you're just paying the value of your treatment plus a small fixed cost. Yeah, um, you know, you're, you're, you've spent too much time teaching Econ 101, where, where, we find, where we, we, we're at 5%. We figure out that markets can handle 95%, and then you're going to focus on the last 5% and tell me, no, the government's got to run everything. Uh, <laughs> it does. So like any insurance, uh, health status insurance, you have to buy it before uh, information is revealed that you're sick. Uh, that's fairly reasonable. Now, uh, one answer to that is let's do this at the family level. Uh, so I can buy um, health status insurance before I conceive a child <laughs> uh, for that child. And then if there's a genetic uh, problem um, that, that's knowable, then, um, then, the kid, uh, then the kid is covered. The other answer, so I, I will have, uh, you know, it's perfectly reasonable, perfectly now we're, Unless you're in a at two o'clock in the morning drinking uh, drinking stuff with libertarians, it is allowable for the government to step in when there's a, a you know a very clear market failure. I would be fine with uh, when we start this up, and you Tyler have some genetic uh, you know known genetic quantity that means you're going to be more expensive. The government gives you a lump sum. Here's fifty grand, and we'll put that in your health status insurance account, and that will fund your higher uh, insurance payments for the rest of your life. See you later. Uh, there's, you know, there's a, a clear argument for lump sum transfers uh, to be ex post insurance uh, mediated by the government. Um, if that's all the government did, and then left the rest of the health care and insurance industry free to cutthroat, free market, innovative competition, drive out the incumbents, serve you and be better, I'd be fine with it. Now, here's a quotation from you online, which I, I didn't follow. I'd like for you to explain. I think uh -oh. you're talking about second or third best here. But you wrote, quote, it has made me a tentative supporter of Medicare for any. What did you mean? I mean, uh, the biggest original sin I see now in our health care system is uh, cross subsidies. Uh, the government wants to provide for poor people and other people. It doesn't want to make them pay. We're old people. They don't want to pay. But the government doesn't want to raise taxes and provide their health care. So what the government does is it tells hospitals, for example, you must treat everybody who walks in the emergency room. Hospitals say, that's nice. Where are we getting the money from? And then the government says, well, uh, you can overcharge uh, 
private, you know, uh, employer provided insurance, which will force employers to give. And you can overcharge the few uh, cash paying customers who come in. Well, the problem with that is you can't allow competition. If you're overcharging people, then you can't allow Hospital B to come in and say, you know, we're, we're going to offer a less price and we won't even have an emergency room. And so you've killed competition. And that, I think, is the the, the original sin, the, the, the deepest problem in our healthcare system. We talk about, you know, they just recently said hospitals have to disclose prices. Heavens, disclose prices. Well, that says that's a sign this is a horribly uncompetitive business, uh, you know, an airline that tried to not disclose prices till you get off the plane would be bankrupt because no one would go there. There's competition in, in the airlines. Uh, so how do we solve this problem? Um, uh, you know, just forcing hospitals to, to, to post prices, they have to cross subsidize the Medicare Medicaid that doesn't pay anything like what it costs from something else uh, because the government's not paying. So that's why your and my health care, you and me don't need health insurance. Uh, we, you know, we have enough money. We need maybe something catastrophic if we get something that costs $10 million, which is, you know, you have to get some really rare form of cancer for that. Uh, you and me could afford to pay for this like we pay for our vet uh, bills. Uh, so why can't we be in the total free market? Well, uh, because there's this cross-subsidy rig going on. So here's the deal. Why don't we? I said tentatively. <laughs> uh, let the government just forthrightly uh, raise taxes, uh, pay for health insurance for poor people, indigent people. We could do a lot better job for the schizophrenics on the streets uh, and for whoever the government wants to pay <clears throat> their health care. Do that on budget, allocated, so we can all see what the government's paying for. And then you and me can be freed to the mercies of an unbridled competitive free market. And if somebody wants to come in and offer us care cheaper and set up a new hospital, they don't need a certificate of need, they don't need all the other stuff, they can come in and, and uh, offer us uh, whatever, they, whatever we're willing to pay for. And uh, <clears throat> we would get far better care, far cheaper, uh, much more medical innovation than we do now. So you and me could be free to, to the wonders of the free market if we would pay taxes to support whatever the government wants to support. And then we can look at the budgets and see what that is. So that is, we're at kind of the worst of all systems uh, right now in that this system of cross subsidies is just atrociously wasteful uh, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and inefficient. It, it does provide reasonably good care, but at, at uh, just hugely more expense than, than it should. Um, so um, that's the second best, yeah. In the year I, 2004, you were national gliding champion. Tell us <laughs> what you achieved. Uh, so I fly gliders, which are uh, beautiful looking airplanes uh, without engines. And uh, the way they work, uh, I was only a champion in one class, which wasn't the very high profile class, I have to admit. Uh, but you competed and, in the world championship in Hungary, correct? Yes, I did. I did. Uh, I didn't do that great, but I had a wonderful uh, time in Hungary. Um, this is a serious sport. Uh, wh what you do is you, um, it, it's about speed, and you, uh, you try to find these rising currents of air called thermals, and you glide to the next one. Uh, our typical races around here in California will be two to 300 miles uh, or more. Uh, I, I did one at uh, 90 miles an hour last year. I've done them over 100 miles an hour. This is average over 300 miles uh, flying without an engine. Uh, up, altitudes up to 18,000 feet around here, not so high on the East Coast. And you're racing these guys. It's like a sailboat race in three dimensions uh, at 100 miles an hour uh, flying out over the, uh, the deserts of Nevada. It's just absolutely wonderful. And the, the game is speed. Can you, can you go to Airport A, Airport B, and... Uh, your GPS shows you where you've been and come back and, and do it two minutes faster than the other guy. How good or bad is the government's regulation of gliding? <laughs> uh, an uneasy truce. Um, pretty bad, but uh, just enough to let it survive. The government What's regulated... the main inefficiency? Uh, the FAA. <laughs> but what should they do that they don't? What should they allow? Ah, uh, gliding is, is, is um, they should, uh, the, so they have killed the domestic uh, industry that makes gliders. There's only a couple left in Europe. 
Uh, cert certification of aircraft under the FAA is a disaster. Uh, this is more visible in general aviation power. Go down to your local airport and you will see what looks like a Cuban car lot full of designs from the 1950s. Um, it's just incredibly difficult to certify a general aviation airplane. Uh, their standards for pilot's licenses are ridiculously too high. Uh, and America is one of the best places in the, in the world. When you go around the world, you will notice if you're a pilot how empty the skies are because everywhere else has regulated general aviation completely to death. And the private rules associated with gliding, are they COSEAN and wealth maximizing or are they all screwed up? <laughs> uh, I served for a while on the rules committee that sets the rules for gliding competitions, which was a wonderful experience as far as me understanding political economy and just what's wrong with Congress. I had all sorts of wonderful ideas on the scale of health status insurance and my proposal to reform the issuance of treasury bonds that went exactly as far in the rules committee as my proposals have gone in Washington. Uh, so uh, it's a uh, it's an interesting um, eventually uh, reason prevails. Uh, many of the psychological biases you see in many sports are there. The denial. I, I was a safety advocate, so I had some rules in mind that wouldn't hurt the competition, but that would do a lot to increase the safety of this thing. Uh, and uh, all the same things that, you know, bicycle racers said, oh, we can't have helmets, we won't be able to see. Uh, glider pilots have the same response to any rules that, uh, that make things a little bit safer. So it was, a, it was a great education. So there's finance economist John Cochran, policy economist and blogger and reformer John Cochran, and glider and gliding reformer John Cochran. <laughs> How do they all fit together? How, how many dimensions are needed to explain the whole John Cochran here? Well, I don't know. I think it's all totally consistent, part of uh, part of one piece. Uh, and what's I, the consistent theme that one sees in the gliding as well and the thinking about gliding? I try to, if, you know, we're all bad at reflecting what our own uh, mental strengths and weaknesses are. I try to reduce things down to a very few fundamental principles and a logical structure. That's why when I was in college, I was a physics major. I was great at physics and I, I nearly flunked chemistry uh, because physics, my, my, my peak intellectually was uh, electricity and magnetism where there's like three equations and everything follows from that. Uh, my book on asset pricing, we start with one equation and it has three sides and everything follows from that. Um, similarly, I, I did some work in gliding, trying to apply optimal portfolio theory to the theory of uh, optimal gliding. Uh, so I try to put things together in a logical structure. Fiscal theory of the price level, I'm trying to put, it's now the, the, the damn book's up to 600 pages, and I'm trying to think about all of monetary policy in the structure of one simple present value equation. So that's my habit of mind. Uh, I, I really admire people of different habits of mind. Uh, my historian friends who can keep unbelievable numbers of facts in their citations in their head at one time, I, I just can't do that. Um, mathematician friends who are great at seeing logical structure of things without the, the, the vision. I, I admire that. But that's that's my one uniting theme. Now, I knew your father's work before I ever had heard of you, in particular, his book on historians and historiography of the Italian Renaissance. That's Eric Cochran, for those of you who don't know. What is it intellectually that you learned from your father? Oh my God, so much. And I, so this tells you something. And it's about a great book, Cameron. by the way. Everybody else who's ever heard of my father heard of Florence in the Forgotten Centuries, which is the one I'll, uh, I'll recommend <laughs> online. Uh, that you've read the historiography book uh, says, and I don't know how you do it, that you know, you've read everything that there is, which is sort of this big thing. Uh, he was a, a major influence in my uh, life. Um, one, the historical uh, perspective, uh, you know. I think of that a lot. He was also, um, the, the writing in Forgotten Centuries was wonderful. And my, my best read paper of any is uh, Writing Tips for PhD Students, which passes along a lot of Eric Cochran's writing tips for his history graduate students. Uh, he was an unusual man. He, uh, he took us to uh, Florence, uh, where I spent a lot of time as a kid, and forced us into the local culture. Uh, he was also very connected to the community of the south side of Chicago sent me to public schools there, which was another 
culture. So I certainly learned to navigate other cultures. And uh, we had a fantastic dinner table where I cut my teeth on many things intellectually. I don't agree with a lot, everything he did. He was a converted Catholic uh, who was also a historian who'd read the minutes of the Council of Trent in the original Latin. That was a, uh, that was a challenge for a uh, young, uh, <laughs> for a 16 year old atheist. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that uh, left in me. Now, I also knew your mother's work before I knew your work, in particular her translations of Paola Rossi, especially Rossi on Vico. What is it intellectually that you learned from your mother? <laughs> and my mother. I didn't know any of this about you until preparing for this podcast, I might add. I, I'm just uh, amazed at the range of it. You know, yes, my mother, um, she taught French at the uh, lab schools while I was uh, growing up. A uh, remarkable woman. And after my father died, uh, sadly, just as I got back to the University of Chicago, um, she took on this career of translating and uh, translated many, many books for the University of Chicago Press. I, I would occasionally read what she translated academic books from French and Italian into English. And uh, have you ever tried to read academic history French? Oh, my God. And she managed to make sense of, of that stuff as well. Um, she was a, uh, yeah. She was she was the other part of that dinner table where uh, uh, I, I uh, both learned a lot and, and learned to think. And then they, they're you know they listen to kids even when uh, when they have academic friends around uh, they listen listen to kids. So I was expected to show up and play my part. And except for the one time when I was twelve years old and we had a bunch of historians over and I, I piped up and I said to my dad, Dad, what's the Council of Trent anyway? And he said, Oh my God, I haven't. I could see his, the look in his face. Oh, I haven't told my kid anything. But on the other hand, my wife, uh, Beth Fama, did say, do the same thing at age 12, looked up at a dinner table full of finance people and said, Dad, what's arbitrage? <laughs> now, your wife is also a well-known author. She has a well-received book about mermaids, right? It's fiction. It's called Monstrous Beauty. How has having a wife who writes fiction influenced you intellectually? Uh, yeah, we. Uh, she's a really smart, she's not only a fiction writer, she has a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago and, and a smart person in all sorts of ways. Uh, we don't we don't really do economics at the dinner table together, but we certainly debate, uh, we, we certainly learn a lot about politics and, and uh, current events. And uh, I, I don't delve too deep in her fiction, but it's uh, it's a very intellectual, uh, pursuit for her, and she's really committed to writing great uh, young adult literature, not just uh, not just stuff that sells. And so, yeah, Monstrous Beauty is wonderful. Plus One is a, is her book after that, which I recommend. It's a secretly libertarian uh, young adult uh, romance uh, set in a in a in a world that comes after a pandemic. So, uh, ought to have lots of good book sales now. Do you think Tuscan cuisine is underrated or overrated? Well, Tuscan cuisine is wonderful. <laughs> What's now, your favorite in Tuscan cuisine? Ah, uh, oh my God! How how can where do you start? Uh, you know that the simple there's there's nothing like a ribolita on a cold winter day. Uh, Tuscan cuisine is is supposed to be simple, not not uh, fancy. Um, Conquest's second law, sometimes called O'Sullivan's law. It says that organizations not explicitly set up as right-wing tend to evolve to become left-wing. Why is this true? Organizationally, what happens? That certainly is uh, a, a trenchant observation of the current time. Uh, I'm what I pause to think whether that's true of all places and times. We live in a time when the cultural elite is moving sharply left in a sort of religious revival, a, a great awakening. Um, so institutions, you know, the Ford Foundation now is uh, sharply left is hilarious when you consider who Henry Ford was. That's a great example. All of our uh, universities. So uh, non-competitive institutions are moving sharply left. The institutions of civil society are moving sharply left. But is that, um, is that, that's not always the case. There was a Reagan-Thatcher counter-revolution in the 
uh, 1970s. So, uh, you know, there's the natural tendency. People in a comfortable society start feeling guilty and, and like uh, telling other people what to do and how the government should spend other people's money. Um, Why are economists me? right now moving so much to the left? What's the most structural explanation for the mistake they're making? The highest order account of what's going well, on. Well, except economists have always been left, right? The American economics. But they're much system. more left than 20 years ago. <laughs> yes, and, and uh, passing that on. Um, the, uh, uh, I think the, the single greatest... Uh, uh, you no, know, no, you know, you're right. Uh, well, economists... Um, so the, the question is, why has the left current within economics become more powerful? It always was sort of a, not left-right, a free market versus interventionist uh, debate. That is the debate of all time, um, free market versus interventionist. Uh, lefty ideology gives you a, a moral basis on which to go out and try to run things. But economists, you know, people go into, lots of people go into economics because they want to save the world. And then you take some classes that say the best way to save the world is to stay the heck out of the way. And that's kind of discouraging if you're a young millennial who wants to go in and save the world. So we, we go find. But that's a first. levels explanation, right? Not a change explanation. I don't know. you got to give me three and uh, I'll choose uh, A, B versus C. Well, some of it could be the demographic composition of who becomes an economist has changed, I believe. Hmm. Okay. So there's m many more foreigners. I'm not sure of the net effect there. Uh, it could also mean you just have more political spectra floating around. But I think non-Americans on average are more interventionist than Americans. And at least in terms of the flow of younger people, I believe there are more women. And women on average are further to the left than are men, especially educated women who are probably not yet married. I'm not sure those are the reasons. Uh, okay, I'll, what, uh, I'll disagree. They're to my mind. Okay, so good, good. Now we can have a debate. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's true. The, the foreign, many of the foreigners I know come from socialist -y or or much more interventionist countries. They, my God, I love this free place. Talk to you know an Argentinian about uh, uh, about government. They, they, so I know a lot of libertarian foreigners. I do think so. Uh, economics is a classic case of, of you know the wonders of free immigration because uh, listeners may not know you know foreigners are. are in mo most many economics departments, there's few native-born Americans left. We have scooped up the talent from around the world, and they bring with them some political in inclination. So you're right. Some of them tend to be more lefty. Some of them tend to look at where they come from. You know, the, the people are the people pushing back against Princeton's latest woke outbursts are uh, are Eastern Europeans who say, "Hey guys, socialism. We were there. You don't want it." Uh, foreigners, I do think, are driving the, the other unfortunate feature of contemporary economics. It's increasing careerism. Um, people don't go to a university. When I first got my job and the dean started telling me about the retirement program, I was just glazing over, what are you talking about? I'm not going to be here then. And now people seem to regard their progression in a company, sort of the way the labor markets work in Italy. Uh, that's, that's an unfortunate feature of foreigners. Women are, are there's, there's not that many of them in economics. And, and what's driving the wokey left in, in economics is the, the millennials, um, the American-born millennials who've been through our school systems and our colleges, which, which teach this kind of stuff. Um, if there's anything different about the demographic composition, it's that people like me can't be in economics anymore. And people like Gene Fama can't be in economics anymore. Uh, Gene Fama... Um, he did his internship when he was an undergrad was he worked in the steel mills. Uh, I applied to be an economics graduate student on a lark one month before classes start. Uh, you can't do that anymore. You have to be deeply uh, ingrained in the system starting as an undergraduate. Uh, so maybe there's a self perpetuation uh, in that sense that that wasn't there in the much more freewheeling uh, earlier era. How would you reform the economics profession to make it better along these dimensions? <laughs> You're in charge. You pick the reforms as if you would run the whole gliding committee. What would you do? Well, that's a hard question for a libertarian because... No, it's a voluntary. <laughs> voluntary rules, but you set them. People can secede if they don't like it. Uh... You can make a tenure clock 10 years everywhere. You could make it two years. You could abolish tenure. 
a lot of different things you could do. Yeah, but I have to obey some much harder rules here that I'm, I'm not allowed to, you know, put myself in charge. We, we have to somehow obey competition. I mean, this, it's a remarkable lack of competition among universities. So uh, I'll be, uh, let's get rid of the entire legal structure of the nonprofit organization uh, to start with. Uh, I think that'll lead to getting rid of tenure. I mean, tenure is useful for one thing. It, uh, it forces people to make a decision. Um, tenure is, is not about the permanent employment. It's about when do you get to have a vote on who else gets to uh, be in this place. And it forces people to sit down and read the damn papers and say, should we keep Tyler on or not? And that's kind of a useful thing, but you can have those uh, without tenure. So I, I have to go back to my uh, libertarian instincts and say what we need is a healthy dose of uh, competition in this business. And, uh, but why is for-profit education done so poorly? We've had a lot of it, and it's we've had it in other countries, like Philippines, Turkey, in earlier decades had a lot of for-profits. They seem to disappear largely for market-based reasons. I don't know. They're in a competition with a heavily government-subsidized uh, sector. Um, some of the, the for-profit charter schools, I, I gather, are doing a bang-up job. Um, the big problem with being a nonprofit, so a nonprofit is protected from the market for corporate control. If Stanford is screwing up, uh, you can't just buy up all the shares, kick out the management and improve it. Uh, so I, I, that's also part of the secret of why hospitals are so screwed up uh, because they are also protected from that market. The whole nonprofit business, this is a, a side issue which we should talk about sometime. Um, not the nonprofit status in the U.S. has been like like everything else, horribly misused. Now it's it's you know a cover. It, it's a lot of it is a, a cover for uh, getting out of the estate tax and for subsidizing political activity at taxpayer expense. Uh, so I, I was trying to think of things that open it up to competition uh, better, um, and and that that ha you know have if we have to think about root ways to change things, uh, I think that'd be, you know, you make me benevolent dictator. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways we could run. Um, uh, we, could, we could run journals. Uh, I think uh, putting things to the market test of ideas would be a lot more helpful. Uh, but we got to face the fact that a lot of the market, uh, a lot of the, our market is who wants economists? The Federal Reserve wants economists to justify what the Federal Reserve is doing. Uh, the regulatory agencies want economists to justify what the regulators are doing. A lot of the market for economists is government intervention. So they're going to turn out a product that justifies government intervention when faced with the market. How did you become a libertarian? <laughs> uh, long period of uh, reflection. And it was, you know, I, I went to a uh, I grew up in kind of a liberal community and was unthinkingly that. And you just start reading, you know, and, and you read classic things. And, and I told you my habit of mind is to put things in in logical structure. And if you start thinking cause and effect and logical structure and not just my feelings about things and the government has to jump, uh, then you are drawn to. So, uh, you know, there's that classic reading list I had as well as you had. I had some conversion moments. Um, so this is how I became an economist, really, is the same thing, which is uh, understanding social problems as dispassionate cause and effect uh, things and, and recognizing how um, they didn't work otherwise. I'll, I'll tell you two. One was, uh, I was a kid uh, reading the newspaper, uh, actually, in, in Italy about them. There was a plan. The government of Tuscany, there was a problem with vipers. These are little poisonous snakes. And the government of Tuscany said, we'll get rid of the vipers. We'll, uh, we'll give a bounty of a thousand lira per viper, and that'll clean up the viper problem. <laughs> well, the sturdy farmers of the Casentino found out that they could raise vipers uh, at a thousand, a thousand lira per viper. They could raise a lot of vipers fast, and, and the supply overwhelmed the demand. Uh, you, you know, stories of well-intentioned uh, ideas that have unintended consequences uh, that, that rank. There's, there's cause and effect. Uh, that, that fits in lovely. And the other one's my, my main big conversion moment. I remember it. It's the 1970s. I was taking a class in microeconomics. And this was a time when welfare was a big problem. Moynihan and the destruction of the black family was, was in the air. And you could see the dysfunction on the south side of Chicago where I live. And lots of moralizing about it. 
And I saw the budget constraint facing a, uh, you know, a, a, teenage, uh, a teenage woman of not many means that said, if you have a kid and don't work, we'll give you an apartment and some money. And, and then there's that kink in the budget constraint. What I saw was um, eye-opening to someone attuned to many different cultures. It was there, but for the grace of God go I. We are all the same. We just face different budget constraints. Here's an analysis of a social problem, a deep social problem, that is just completely cause and effect, and, and we know how to fix this, and you don't have to get into morals and psychology and religion and all the rest of it. Uh, so that, that was my conversion point of the, as an economist. And it, you know, it, once you start thinking that way, you end up as a, a libertarian. Now, I'm a libertarian with many adjectives in front of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, conservative, rule of law, um, Pax Americana. <laughs> there's, there's a lot, uh, there's many different brands of libertarian. Should more economists blog? Uh, You're doing it, right? We were all surprised when we saw you doing it. Well, I don't like the competition, so no, stay out of it, guys. <laughs> Everybody else in any business, uh, in you know, the first thing any... Uh, <laughs> Any businessman does is uh, try to get rid of the competition. Uh, the blog is an interesting art form. I don't know how long it will last. It allows me to write uh, short essays uh, quickly that seem to have some following, even though I should edit each of them for a week and make them better. Um, so I've, I've found that a useful way to get ideas out and to uh, uh, get, get a, and to hear from other people. Uh, I think that forum is is good. I, so our academic journals, speaking of, you know, our academic journals are a disaster. Uh, and uh, see, blogs seem to be an interesting way to get ideas back and forth in economics. They merge economics and politics. Uh, I don't know if that's a good or a bad idea. Uh, but um, the, the problem with all of us doing it is, you know, I, I I think what we're seeing in the market is less blog, which is a personal brand name, and more of um, the Vox Quillette and so forth, curated uh, things that are not uh, publications. Um, so that's really a question about how do you, what's the right format for getting uh, essay length things uh, into the debate uh, more quickly, both on actual economics and economics and, and politics. And last question, after you finish your 600 page book on the fiscal theory of the price level, what is it you think you will do next? <laughs> my problem in life is that my list of great uh, projects that I, earth shaking projects is growing uh, as I get older and, and try to bite them off. Uh, so I have to pick one or the other. Um, so which one do I want to do? Of course, one should finish what one has started. Uh, the fiscal theory of the price level was going to be something that in included the theory and how it explains all of historical experience with inflation, money, and so forth. I'm at 600 pages, haven't finished the theory part, so one, one should do that. Uh, the, uh, one needs to understand. I still don't know that I have a good story for the inflation of the 70s and 80s, which is a gaping hole. So I should finish that, but I probably won't. Uh, I want to go back to, I did mention, I think, that uh, um, why it takes so much trading to get uh, information into prices. That's kind of like the, I, that's a big unknown thing about asset markets. So I'm tempted to go back to that. Uh, and I'm tempted to also, uh, part of me wants to go into political philosophy. Um, you, you and I, <clears throat> the danger of libertarians is, oh, well, just but the question you asked me, make me king for a day. Well, make us king for a day and we could solve most of the problems of the American economy in about 10 minutes flat, yet our Congress doesn't do it. So um, why? what is there about our political system that is unable to uh, come to these sensible cause and effect, obvious solutions to obvious uh, problems? Um, it's kind of interesting. We were, America had this amazing flowering of, of political engineering in 1790 and and we seem to have just lived in the building ever since and and not really done a great job of thinking about it so i think that's that's what needs in, in any scientific pursuit you need to start with answers not with questions if you start with big questions you're never going to get anywhere uh i think i have some answers but that certainly strikes me as as a the question how can we better engineer 
our political uh, organization, kind of a constitutional moment to produce the better economic outcomes that you and I know are there and just uh, sitting, you know, wait. I, you and I are techni techno optimists. Uh, we're, I think we think that the U.S., the world could be vastly wealthier, healthier and cleaner if just the regulatory state would get out of the way. And that's a political question. Uh, a political economy, a political structure, a constitutional question, I think. So I'm tempted to turn my attention to that. John Cochran, thank you very much. Thank you.